Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church, and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, I walked in to do my mic check thing and everyone's like, whoa, look at Nate. He's all dressed up for Christmas. I couldn't find my black shirt. Um, I have a preaching church shirt. It's got, it's, it's got four buttons on it. So it's uh, fancy, uh, but I couldn't find it. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be festive, but what the heck? It's Christmas. So uh, my name is Nate. If you don't know me, my name is Nate. I serve as the creative director here at Res, and uh, I am excited to bring you week two of The Unexpected King. Uh, but first, speaking of Christmas, I want to give you a little Christmas story. So when I was a young child, uh, I was really into G.I. Joes. You guys know what G.I. Joes are, right? Real American hero. So I loved all things Army and all that stuff. And there was this toy that came out. It was a play set for your G.I. Joes. It was called the USS Flag. Yeah. Yes, Pastor Dale. Oh, okay. Just I, look at how happy these kids are, okay? <laughs> that, look at it. Still, to this day, I'm just in awe of its wonderment. It is s seven feet long. Yeah. It was crazy. I think it, to this day, it's still the biggest play set um, that, available. Uh, and you could look at all the figures you could fit on there, that kid's talking on one of those things. Uh, they're just having a great time. They're best friends. And I really wanted one of these, just like every other kid. Daniel, I'm sure you wanted one of those too. Um, and really, really wanted it. Uh, it was $109 in 1985. So I think now that's what, like $1,000 or something? So, um, but my parents were filthy rich. They could afford that, whatever. So I, that's what I really, really wanted. And this is crazy. Christmas, do we have the next picture? <sighs> look at that kid. You look familiar? <laughs> well, he shouldn't because I never got the USS flag. <laughs> I got that from Google, okay? And that kid probably grew up to be well-adjusted and <laughs> his parents just put him on the right track. <laughs> but I never got the USS flag. I think I got... <laughs> sweater or something that keeps you alive, something dumb like that. But, um, you know, I really wanted that. Um, I expected that in, in some way and never got it uh, to this day. Still haven't received the USS flag. But um, 
It's like a thousand bucks on eBay if anyone wants to pick one up. I'll accept. But we often have this view of God based on our experiences, our environments. We, we think God is one thing. We expect God to do a certain thing, act a certain way, and, and sometimes he doesn't. In fact, I find a lot of times in my life he, he doesn't do it the way that I think he should do it. Uh, he does things in a really unexpected way, and that tends to throw us. But I want to tell you today the big point of the message today is that we can still trust God, and we still should trust God even in the unexpected. Um, and the reason I believe this is in Isaiah chapter 9, the text that we're going through today, he's given four names, four distinct descriptives. Uh, I'm going to run down those really quick, but we'll touch on each one. The four names are, number one, he's a wonderful counselor. Two, he's a mighty God. Three, he's an everlasting father. And four, he's the prince of peace. And his ways are higher than ours because he sees farther and his methods are better than ours. So uh, we're going to jump into this text. If you have your Bible, we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. All right, let's read this together. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That is a really, really great prophecy. That is awesome. We have a new ruler, a righteous kingdom. We're going to have peace, justice, all the good things. This is essentially the USS flag of prophecies. Okay? But let's talk about context. Uh, when this prophecy was given by the prophet Isaiah, uh, Israel, in Israel, things were dark. A judgment was coming, and Assyria was threatening to invade. But I find, like in this story, God has a track record of doing great things in dark times. Um, when we are unfaithful, God is faithful. When we are sinful, God saves sinners. When we are in darkness, the light is coming. And when we are about to be destroyed, God sends a rescuer. However, in this case, it did take some time. It took about 700 years from the time of this prophecy till the time of Jesus. But then boom, 700 years later, God's grand plan for rescue, the wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace came. And he came in the form of a baby. So imagine that. And what's, who's this mighty warrior? He's here. And they're like, is he, is he buff? Like, He's a baby, so. No. Does the baby know karate? I, I don't, how's he gonna do this? Well, they knew it was gonna be a child. It mentions a child, a son. But, I, you know, I'll ask that question. Why, why didn't God just send, like, a full-grown Chuck Norris warrior guy to uh, deliver Israel? Why did he specifically choose a baby? Well, like I said, God often moves in unexpected ways, but sending a child, sending a baby, especially in the circumstance that he was sent, uh, it's a really great illustration of how God will use weakness to overcome power, foolishness to overcome wisdom, and a child to defeat evil. What illustrates our dependence on God more than the fate of the world being placed on a child? But this child was special. As it says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And Jesus was special because he was fully God and he was fully human. Uh, there's two words that illustrate that in this text. There's the word born and there's the word given. Okay. Born, uh, basically, he was born. He was uh, given a human birth, so he was undoubtedly human. But how can a God, how can God be born? Well, there's only one way that that can happen, and that's through a virgin birth. So Jesus was like us in every way in humanity except for one thing. He didn't sin. So in order for him to be born into humanity, he had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit because if he was conceived by a man, Joseph, he would come in under the curse of sin. Does that make sense? Okay. So he was 
given a virgin birth for that reason. But he was like us in, in all the ways. Uh, he got sleepy, right? So there's a story in Matthew 8, 23, where there's the storm and the disciples are on a boat and uh, things are going nuts. And they're like, where's Jesus? And he's asleep in the storm. I wish I could sleep like that. I haven't had a full night's rest in 30 years. Um, that would be really cool to be asleep in, in the storm. So he got sleepy. He got tired. Uh, number two, he got hungry. Uh, we all get that. Uh, after 40 days of fasting in Matthew 4, he was hungry. Uh, number three, he had emotions. When Lazarus died, he cried. Okay, so he had human emotions. Uh, he, could, he suffered and he died. He felt pain. Um, when he gave his life on the cross, cross in Matthew 27, obviously he was human. He felt pain and he, he died. Um, so he was undoubtedly human, but he was also undoubtedly God. Uh, the text says that he was, a son was given. Given is past tense, essentially means that Jesus was God before he was born and remained God after he was human. So he was there in the beginning. Uh, it's kind of hard to understand that, but uh, in John 1, it says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Essentially means Jesus is the only person who ever existed before, who existed before he was born. Cool? Okay, so he was human, but he was also God. Kind of a hard concept to understand, but there it is. So we've established that Jesus was this unexpected king, but he was also given four names by the prophet Isaiah. And those four names, as I listed before, we're gonna go through those one by one. The first one is Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Has anyone ever uh, been to any sort of counseling or, or sought counsel from someone, a pastor or anything like that? Yeah, so, or given counsel? Yeah. Uh, not always great. Sometimes we're given bad advice. Um, for me, I was trying to think of a time when I, I received bad counsel. I've been pretty fortunate. I've, I've had some great leaders in my life, but there was this one time where I went in for counseling. Uh, my family at the time was just kind of falling apart and things were not going great. Um, so I went, my pastor at the time noticed, you know, something was off. So he brought me in and we were talking through it. And <laughs> this is crazy, but... Um, he's like, you know, I noticed you haven't tithed in a while. I was like, okay. I also haven't got paid in a while, but let's... Um, so he's like, I noticed you haven't tithed in a while. I think the, the turmoil going on in your family is due to you not trusting God by you not giving. Uh, let me tell you what. <laughs> I'm not a violent person, but... <laughs> I you know, actually didn't get mad, I started crying because I was like so hurt that a person I trusted would, that was the go-to. It's like, oh, your family's falling apart? It's probably because you didn't give us money. Oh, I just, dude. Now, I'm not saying he was a bad person, I just, this bad theology will do that, okay? That was an example of what we would call bad counsel, okay? But Jesus is not like that. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. A story that illustrates this is um, maybe one that you wouldn't think of, but I thought really uh, contextualized this, is the woman at the well. If you've been in church, you've probably heard this story a bunch. If you don't, I'm gonna summarize it. Uh, Jesus is going, he sees a woman at the well, and she's uh, basically there not to be seen with each other. She was, her, she was looked down on in society, um, and Jesus just goes up to her and starts talking to her and says, hey, um, can I have some of that water? And, uh, you know, she's like, you don't, you know, okay, you're not supposed to be talking to me though. And essentially in that conversation, he tells her, well, I also have water. It's living water, okay? She's like, wow, I really want some of that water. And he says, well, go get your husband. She's like, oh, I don't, yeah, I don't have one. And he's like, I know, you have five. You've had five. And <laughs> she's like, uh, you know, blown away by this. How, how would he know this? But the thing that is um, 
that really stands out about that story is that didn't happen. You know, there, there, society, from a society standpoint, he was not to associate with her, but it really shows that Jesus doesn't care about those constructs. He doesn't care about what a person looks like, where they're from, anything like that. He goes to them, okay? His conversation with her offers her essentially salvation. And on top of that, you know, uh, we often think that because Jesus, uh, oh, he hung out with sinners and tax collectors and drunkards and as if Jesus was like, pour me another one, you know. Uh, he went to people, but he didn't necessarily affirm sin. He was very tactful, graceful in his um, correction. And that's what he was doing here. And so that, we read that story as Jesus going to her and, and offering salvation, but then also, you know, like, you know, I know about your life as well. And just such a beautiful way that he did that. He didn't lead off with that. You know, he's like, Let, can I have some water? Thirsty. I think that story is so great. It's such a contrast to a lot of times the way that we approach things like that, or we approach correction, or, or you, know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's just a beautiful picture of that. He's a wonderful counselor he, he, because he has no bias, he has no prejudice, um, but he will call you to holiness because he's holy. So it's both. It's not just Jesus hung out with tax collectors and drunkards and then was like, all right, peace out, you know, keep doing your sin thing. He's like, no, let's also stop the sin thing. Uh, let's repent because this is going to destroy your life. He's a wonderful counselor. Number two, mighty God. It wouldn't be a Nate Parrish sermon if I didn't bring in comic books in some aspects, so uh, I'm going to do that. But when they were told the prophecy about a king coming to deliver them, they were expecting a warrior like David, come with a sword, lay that, put the hammer down, if you will. Uh, <laughs> But he didn't necessarily do that. And at, immediately in my mind popped this illustration, of course, where uh, there's the movie Thor. I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen it 600 times. But uh, essentially, Thor is uh, given a hammer. He's, he's next in line to be king. And he uses this power to essentially start wars. He's very aggressive, arrogant, all these things. And he starts a war with the Frost Giants. This is so nerdy. But <laughs> his, dad, his dad, Odin, is like, I'm taking your power from you. I'm exiling you to Earth. You're not worthy. So he goes to Earth. He's just a guy at this point. And he has to um, kind of learn what it means to, to be human. And, and through it, there's this part in the movie where he, he can no longer pick up the hammer. The hammer's like at this research facility. He can't pick it up. He realizes, oh, I'm, I'm just a guy. And... Um, through this, uh, his brother Loki sends <laughs> this. Uh, I'm going to edit this out when I put it on YouTube. <laughs> but uh, sends a destroyer to essentially wipe out this little small town in New Mexico where he's at. And, he's, and uh, what Thor does is he goes, approaches the destroyer. He's talking to Loki. He's like, hey, leave these people alone. I'm sorry for what I did. You, you know, take me, whatever. And the destroyer kills him. Um, and then at that moment, he becomes worthy, and then the hammer comes, and then he like, yeah, he does the thing. But I thought it was, it was, it was cool because it, it really showed that uh, it's a small little, it's not exact, but it's a small little kind of a Christ archetype there where he doesn't use power, uh, he doesn't abuse power, he's not arrogant, he actually just sacrifices himself for these people, and that's how he becomes king. So it's kind of like an upside down kingdom, if you will. I just thought that was cool. It's, you know, it's not an exact parallel, but you get the idea. They wanted a warrior like this to come in and put Israel back on top, but what they got was something unexpected. In Philippians 2, 3, it says this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. They wanted this warrior to come in, but instead he came and he died. Jesus chose to yield power rather than wield power because he could have, I mean, he's God in human flesh. He, he could have overthrown the government. He could have done all these things that they wanted him to do, but instead he became a servant. That's, that's real power. And we're not used to that in our society. When someone has power, they use it, they abuse it, and they just want more power. And instead, Jesus yields his power. Number three, he's an everlasting father. Jesus was the only person who could reveal God's fatherly character to humanity because he is part of the Godhead. In John 14, verse nine and 10, it says, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I, that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Growing up, uh, I liked to go to bed early, which is weird for a kid. I really liked to go to bed early because my dad would stay up late. So he would stay up late and he had one of those like dad recliners, you know? They're like brown and they're just <laughs> gross. We had one of these dad recliners and he would, I knew that if I went to bed early, that he would still be awake because he would fall asleep on the recliner every single night watching TV. I really liked that because I like going to bed and hearing the, the TV because I knew my dad was there. You know, he was like in the next room. And I loved that. I felt so safe because he was, he was there. He was asleep. And then by the time I was asleep, you know, he went to bed and I was already asleep. And then uh, in the morning, because he'd wake up so early, I would hear the shower going. And then I also loved that because then I knew he was there in the morning. So that was like my whole, all the way through high school, that was my whole uh, existence of sleep. I like to go to bed early because I wanted to hear my, know my dad was there. Well, that's my dad and he was a great dad and maybe you have a dad and he's good or he's, he's not great, but take that good dad and then multiply by a quadrillion and that's Jesus as father. Everlasting father. Um, what we think of as a good dad, he's so much more than that. And you know, in, in here, there's probably a bunch of people uh, who have good relationships with their dad or bad or, or whatever. Um, and I pray that you reconcile that and however that comes about. But the one thing I could tell you is whatever shortcomings your father has, uh, God doesn't have those. He's an everlasting father. Number four, he's also the Prince of Peace. This one is uh, interesting because, I don't know if you've uh, looked around, but there's not a, a lot of peace on earth. You know, the peace on earth, goodwill to men, the angel. And we're like, okay, uh, where is it though? You know, there's a, uh, New York Times did an article in 2003 that in the past 3,400 years of human existence, we have only been at peace for 268 of those years, which is about 8%. Yeah, and um, we're not at peace right now. <laughs> we're super not at peace right now. Um, so how is Jesus the Prince of Peace? Well, there's three types of peace that Jesus brings. Uh, number one, there's the peace from God. So this is the ultimate peace when Christ comes back and he reigns on earth and there will be peace. Because there will be one ruler, there won't be several candidates fighting each other, there's just one king. That's the peace from God. Number two, there's the peace of God. This is talked about in John 14, uh, verse 27, where it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, but let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the peace of God, so this is uh, circumstantial when you can feel peace in um, times of trouble. So like we talked about when Jesus was asleep in the storm, when he had the peace of God, he was sleeping through that even though the circumstances were nuts, he still had peace. You ever, ever experienced that? If you're a Christian here, like things going haywire, but yet you're still like, yeah, God's gonna work it out. Yep. 
Yeah, that's the peace of God. Number three, there's also the peace with God. Uh, in Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the peace with God. So um, the gospel essentially is a we are sinners, born to sin, we sin, we are separated from God due to that sin. But through the sacrifice of Christ, we are granted forgiveness if we believe in him, okay? Uh, He's justified for us by rising from the dead. This is the gospel. This creates that peace with God. So while we were separated through Jesus, we are brought back into peace with God if we believe. That's the peace with God. In my life, I was saved about 10 years old. I grew up in a Christian school. I went to a Christian school growing up, which was really great. Um, I I know people have mixed feelings on that. I highly recommend it. I really loved it, except for when they made us wear uniforms. Not into that. (laughs) Couldn't wear black. So (laughs) I had to wear khaki. (laughs) And... uh, um, but, you know, being a Christian, being a believer, and then after graduating and going into the real world, which going to college and getting a job, all these things, um, I really found myself just with no peace. I had no peace at all. Uh, everything was going wrong. Pick it. It was going wrong. Um, I was, my family in every aspect was just falling apart. Um, I had a relationship that was very toxic. That word gets thrown around a lot, but it was actually toxic. Uh, I was working in construction, (laughs) which is a great job, but not when you're on the bottom of the totem pole and you're the one that has to go into the house when the sewer line breaks. (laughs) Come on, man. Uh, So it just, I had no peace. And watching my family disintegrate, watching my sister and, and her whole situation disintegrate, with my nephews and all that stuff was just, I had no peace. Um, I was in a relationship I should have been in, but I was, I was in it anyways. I, looking back, I didn't realize that at the time, but I, what I would do is I would come home from work and I would sleep um, from like five to nine, and then eat and then go back to bed. That's, I just, oh, I'm tired. I wasn't tired, I was depressed, right. It didn't click. I, I, that was, essentially, I had no peace so I was trying to escape, and the only place I knew that was when I was asleep, <laughs> unconscious, so I didn't have to experience all this chaos. And I'm a pretty hard-headed person, so I uh, fought with God for a long time, and it finally got to the point where the vodka bottle was looking really good. I'd never been a drinker, but was doing that, and um, I just was like, all right, I, I know this is bad. Um, some of this I can change and some I can't. Uh, a lot of the chaos was brought on by myself, but some of it wasn't. Some of it was just circumstance that I couldn't control. So I asked God and I repented and I asked him for peace and I had peace. I had to do some things. I did have to break off that relationship. I had to um, really uh, lean in on God a lot more. But I was granted that peace. But, you know... Um, Becoming a Christian and, and believing in God doesn't mean that your life all of a sudden is, is like perfect or God just like takes the stuff away. It was, a lot of it was still there, but I had a peace because I knew I could trust God in these unexpected circumstances that I, that I found myself in. And the Christmas story, the gospel story, is not that there won't be darkness, but that there will be a light shining in the midst of darkness. And probably all of us in this room today or tomorrow at some point uh, will find themselves in a lack of peace. Maybe you're a Christian in here and um, you are looking for that Prince of Peace. Um, Things are going, there's chaos in your life and you need that peace. Well, you can pray to God and you can ask him for that peace. And we're going to do that today. We're going to have our prayer team up front. And I want to invite you to come up and talk with someone because that helps too. Sometimes just talking about it helps, you know, uh, verbalizing it. And then praying and asking God for peace in the midst of your chaos. Uh, some of you, maybe you don't have peace with God. Um, you've never heard the gospel message. You are far from God. You're still living in sin. 
and there's that separation. Uh, I wanna, we wanna pray with you for that as well um, because there is reconciliation to be found. Jesus shed his blood so we could reconcile with God, that we could have peace with God. And if you don't have that peace, I really want you to have that peace. Um, that's, that's what we, this is what all this is. Like the Christmas, all this is Jesus coming, living as a human, dying, rising again so that we could have peace with God. That's the whole point of everything that we do here. We don't come here just to sing Christmas songs. I didn't wear this to blend in. I really didn't, I promise you. It's the only thing I had. We want to do this so you can have peace with God. So if you're in one of those camps, you need the peace of God in your life or you need peace with God, we want to pray with you. Uh, We have a prayer team up here. I want you to come up, talk to someone, pray with someone. I'm going to pray, uh, but before I do, I want to read this quote I found from uh, Ray Ortland, and uh, I just thought it was a really, really great quote. It kind of sums up this this whole message. I love babies. As a wonderful counselor, he has the best ideas and strategies. Let's follow him. As the mighty God, he defeats his enemies easily. Let's hide behind him. As the everlasting father, he loves us endlessly. Let's enjoy him. And as the prince of peace, he reconciles us while we are still his enemies. Let's welcome his dominion 